I thought seeing it's uh, so close to Christmas, we might make a little trip today to Bethlehem. It's been my privilege to visit the town of Bethlehem scores of times over the years. And I never visited the town without making a journey to the House of Hope. Now, the problem of blindness among Palestinians is about 10 times higher than in the West, in Europe or in America. And this problem developed in such a way that uh, it left hundreds upon hundreds of children uh, with no marketable skills, and many of them sat begging by the side of the road. And uh, back in the 50s, there was a young blind girl named May Lada, and she was taken in by an English woman into her home and was given a little task of dusting around the house and so on, paid a little bit. And uh, the woman took her and patiently taught her how to read by reading Braille and specifically taught her to read the Bible. This lady was a, a godly Christian and led little May to Christ. As May Lada grew, she had a growing burden for other blind children in the community. And the Lord laid on her heart to start a home for these children. And she said, well, Lord, I don't have any money. And you may have noticed I'm blind. But the Lord laid it on her heart to provide this place. And every year as we would visit there, they would take these children and teach them marketable skills, carving olive wood or making brooms, whatever it might be to make a little money. But in the meantime, they poured into their heart the story of the Savior. And there in the town of Bethlehem, now largely a Muslim town, was this little enclave of believers who shone brightly for the Lord Jesus. I remember the director at that time uh, saying to me, you know, the, the neighbors here, they love what we do, but they still don't love our Lord Jesus. And how it reminded me of the words found in Luke chapter 2 and verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, this little word room doesn't actually mean what we think of as a room. It's simply a primary word meaning a spot, a place. There was no place for him in Bethlehem. And as I thought of that, the same word that is used is found in Matthew 27, verse 33, and when they were come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, that's where they crucified him. And then I think of the beautiful words of the Lord Jesus as he gathered with his own just before he went to Calvary. And uh, the one for whom there was no place is the one who also said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. No place for him. But then he took the place of ours, the, the place of Calvary, and then said, my place is your place, and I have prepared a place for you. What a beautiful story this is. Well, as you uh, come into the little town of Bethlehem, um, it's kind of in a, the little saddle, little crotch of a couple of hills, and it's only six miles south of the heart of Jerusalem. It was not very far at all. In fact, as you travel north, this is the Hebron Road. The, the Hebron Road travels south maybe 20 miles to the town of Hebron, where Abraham pitched his tent so long there in the plains of Mamre. But as you head up this Hebron Road, twisting through the hills towards Jerusalem, the first thing you spy on your right, if you're watching carefully, is a stone chair. It was placed there by the widow of the famous pre-Raphaelite artist, Holman Hunt. He used to sit there and paint pictures 
of Jerusalem. And so it's not very far. It's just uh, on the outskirts of Bethlehem. You can see it there. And just beyond that is the city of Jerusalem. And uh, th this was the site, the reason the chair was placed there. This is the site that Abraham would have had from Bethlehem, just over the brow of the hill. He would have had his first view of the place. He saw the place afar off. And then we've traveled just a little further, uh, only a few hundred yards. And to our right is Ramat Rahel, the heights of Rachel. And just at the base of that hill, of course, the, the grave, the traditional site of the burial of Rachel. It was there that she gave birth to the little boy with two names, the son of my sorrow, and the father renames him the son of my right hand. So Bethlehem is very close to Jerusalem, so strange that these men in the, the palace of Herod, when the wise men said, we've come looking for him, uh, where's the place? And, uh, and Herod called in these uh, religious leaders and they didn't have to get out their concordance. They knew the verse. They quoted Micah 5, 2 right off the top of their head. Where is the place? Bethlehem, the place of Bethlehem. And, and so here our blessed Lord was born in Bethlehem. Now, as we think about this, this house of hope, it's gone through changes over the years. Uh, nonetheless, there is a testimony there, surrounded by this Muslim community. Here the light shines. And we were deeply moved as we met some older ladies who had been with May Lada for many years, Auntie May, as she was fondly called, and, uh, and to see the hearts of these children transformed by the gospel. And uh, so here, right in the heart of Bethlehem today, though there seems to be no room for the Lord Jesus still in Bethlehem, still he has found a place there so that he might invite these children to his place. Uh, what a wonderful hope we have. And as we think about this time of the year and hear the plaintive words of the hymn, have you any room for Jesus, he who bore your load of sin? As he knocks and asks admission, sinner, will you let him in? May the Lord help us all to make more room for the Lord Jesus in the coming year, more room in our schedule, more room in our conversation, more room in our thoughts that we might make room for the Lord Jesus. For surely he has prepared a place for us. He has prepared for us room in his heart, in his life, in his program, in his will, and ultimately in his home.